Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Roger Kirby. I am president-elect of the Royal Society of Medicine. In fact, uh, in six days' time, I will be president of the Royal Society of Medicine, uh, and I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, welcome to our In Conversation series, where we have informal chats with well-known people who very kindly give their time to the Royal Society of Medicine. And this evening, uh, I'm so pleased to have Norman Lamont, uh, previous Chancellor of the Exchequer, politician uh, through the Thatcher years, through the Meiji years, and in the House of Lords uh, currently. So um, welcome, Norman. Uh, I think before we go back and talk about your very interesting career and, uh, and those historical events uh, that you were actively involved in, uh, tell us a little bit about what you think about the current financial situation, because our current Chancellor, uh, Rishi Sunak, is borrowing rather a lot of money, I detect. Well, before I just comment on the, the debt, let me say that I think the economic situation is quite alarming. I think there is the possibility of a very deep recession coming up. It's not a certainty, but I think it's quite likely. And I think you have to judge everything the Chancellor has done against that background. The measures that the Chancellor has taken are amazingly uh, expensive. I think he had very little alternative but to do it. He's trying to stop the immediate collapse of the jobs market. Uh, but the cost of it is huge. And people are talking about the government borrowing in one year being anywhere between 350 billion and 500 billion pounds. That is like 20, 25% of GDP. This is unprecedented for hundreds of years. How are we going to afford it? The important point to remember is that this will be largely a one-off. This is the consequence of the immediate measures which will not be there when the economy recovers or actually they're going to end in January anyway. And we will have to pay off this year's cost uh, and probably some other costs, but it can be done gradually over time. We are very, very lucky in that interest rates are at extraordinary low levels. Indeed, sometimes they are negative. The government is almost paid to borrow. So the interest rate cost of this extraordinary high level of borrowing is much less than it was, say, at the time of the financial crisis. It doesn't mean that we've discovered a magic money tree. We have to be careful because even with low interest rates, over time, there could be a cost. The principal has to be repaid. and We can't go on accumulating debts at this level. But I think it is an emergency situation and I think we can cope with it. And we're not alone in this. Um, most countries in the world are facing a similar situation. Okay, well, let's go back in, in time because I was so interested when I was reading, I've known you for, for years, of course, but uh, I didn't realize that um, your father in the Shetland Island was the, uh, the island's main surgeon. So just tell us a little bit about your father because all the doctors who are tuned in and listening would be interested to hear that, I'm sure. Well, when you say my father was the main surgeon, my father was the only surgeon and he had to do everything uh, you know i think if there were very very serious things that were beyond his skills perhaps people had to be flown to aberdeen but he did virtually everything my father trained as a general surgeon of course um, he was born in 1898 he went to shetland during the second world war uh, with the Royal Army Medical Corps, and he fell in love with Shetland and decided that he wanted to stay there. He ran a hospital for wounded people from the Navy uh, in Shetland, who had taken ashore there. He also worked with the Norwegian resistance. Well, I say he worked with them. He treated them when they came back. There was a thing called the Shetland bus that used to transport weapons to Norway and get shot up by uh, the Germans on the way. So he got to know some of them. My father really loved Shetland and, you know, he would go out on boats and sometimes, I remember there was one famous occasion which actually made the national press when he delivered a baby in Fair Isle from a lifeboat. My father was literally strapped to the lifeboat giving instructions by radio to people in Fair Isle and actually 
whatever was keeping him tied to the boat broke and he was flung from one side of the lifeboat to the other and broke his leg and several ribs. It was pretty nasty for him. <laughs> it must have been fun growing up there with a, with a sort of famous dad. They, uh, he, he must have been a sort of celebrity on the island in those days, I suppose. Yes, that, that's absolutely right. People didn't take the National Health Service for granted, free medical care for granted. They were extraordinarily grateful. And a few years ago, when I went back to Shetland, well, it wasn't just a few years, perhaps a decade ago or a bit longer, when I went back, I was astonished how people came up to me in the street. And they weren't talking about me as a politician or anything. They're saying, oh, your dad did this for me and your dad did that. And they really remembered. <laughs> but you never thought about uh, doing medicine. You went to school in Musselburgh, I think, uh, did I read? I went, went to school in Musselburgh near Edinburgh, yes, just outside Edinburgh. No, I was always more interested in the arts and history and English, things like that, rather than mm -hmm. science. And, and then you applied to Cambridge, went to Fitzwilliam College, one of the newer colleges. Well, tell, tell us a little about that and, and the, uh, the Cambridge Mafia that uh, you became associated with there? Well, I was quite interested in politics when I went up to Cambridge. My mother was uh, quite political and actually took me to political meetings in Shetland. Uh, remember, you know, used to get crowds even in Shetland going to political meetings. So, but when I went up to Cambridge, I was very interested in politics and I joined all the political clubs, Labour, Liberal, Conservative and Marxist, even though I was basically a Conservative, even if I wasn't quite sure about it. But it was a very political time then. Uh, the Cuban crisis occurred while I was up at Cambridge. There was a very strong CND and left-wing movement, so it wasn't all dominated by Conservatives by any means. And I became very friendly with people like Michael Howard, Kenneth Clark, John Gummer, people like Leon Britton had been up just before me. It was a very political time. And that was really how I made up my mind. I was deeply interested in politics. I found it all tremendously exciting and going to things like the union where cabinet ministers would come down and debate with we pipsqueeps. I mean, I was quite amazed that they did that. Um, but it was a wonderful experience. It was very exhilarating. And, and is that where you sort of developed a knack for public speaking? Because, you know, I'm always impressed as, as a doctor, we have to give lots of talks. But generally speaking, we have a uh, the sort of crutch of a PowerPoint slide, uh, which we can stand beside. And then we, we get all our cues from reading the data off the slides and then explaining them to the audience. But the idea of standing up and giving a, a, a political type speech without any notes and without uh, any slides to help us, it always seems difficult, I think, to us. But at, how did you get into the, the, learn the skill of being able to speak uh, sort of off the cuff in public? Well, I'd never made a speech before I went up to Cambridge. Um, the Conservative Association at Cambridge used to run speaking classes and that was one of the attractions of joining the Conservative Association and I remember they had a lady called Mrs Cusworth who lived in Devonshire Place uh, who used to come up once a month and she would give classes in public speaking and you know there might be 15 of you in a room and she would suddenly announce a topic and make you speak on it even though you'd never thought about it. She'd you know, suddenly say, we're going to have a balloon debate. Should the Queen visit Nigeria? Mr. Lamont, what do you think? And this was um, quite alarming, actually. <laughs> I can imagine, but I suppose it's, it was a great training. And, and so you left Cambridge and went to Rothschilds? Uh, uh, no, no, when I came down from Cambridge, I worked in, I had made up my mind I really wanted to go into politics, and I worked in the Conservative Research Department, part of Conservative Central Office for a couple of years. I was also a personal assistant to Duncan Sands, oh, son-in-law yeah. of Winston Churchill. So I spent two and a bit years on the fringes of politics. I mean, actually, in the research department, it was very, very interesting because I came in touch with people like Ted Heath, Mrs. Thatcher, Ian McLeod, you know, and there was I, age 22. It was sort of quite an extraordinary experience. But then I went into the city and I went to Rothschild. I decided I ought to get some real world experience and do something else. That's probably a, a quite a good experience for a few years. But then you got selected as a, a 
candidate for the Conservative Party, I think first of all in, in Kingston near Hull, was that right? Before Kingston in London? Tell us about those yeah, two. King Kingston upon Hull, yeah. as opposed to Kingston on Thames. Yes, I, my first seat was in 1970 when I stood against John Prescott. Mm -hmm. um, and he defeated me by a small majority of 23,000 votes. Uh, he st still wouldn't speak to me at the count, regarded me as the devil, really, as far as I could see. But I subsequently got to know him, and I must say I, I rather like John Prescott. And uh, he, he was quite a glamorous figure in Hull. You know, he'd done things like appear on Panorama, talking about safety at sea, and everybody thought this was terrific. And of course, he was a leading light, I think, in the national, well, he was a leading player in the National Union of Seamen. Yeah. And uh, he'd been denounced, actually, although not named by Harold Wilson as politically motivated trade unionist. <laughs> well, there are a few of those around in, in those days. So then down to, to Kingston in, in London. And uh, yeah, I suppose you were living down in London in, in those days. So the, the, what was it like, you know, first, your first appearance in Parliament? And was it, it must have been quite daunting, the, the etiquette there, the, the, the so many senior people around who was, I guess, a little bit scary. Tell, tell us about, about the early days as a uh, parliamentarian. Well, I made my maiden speech on the European issue, joining the uh, EC, which I spoke in favour of. I'm sure we'll come on to that in our conversation, you know, general European issues. But the thing that quickly, I got in in May 1972, the thing that, I was 29 then, the thing that then became very, very obvious was the looming conflict with the miners. And of course, in 73, 74, we had the three day week and we had the election fought on the issue of who governs Britain. Yeah. And, you know, it was very dramatic. I mean, people did feel that was the country governable. And you know, Ted Heath had got himself, I think, wrongly now, at the time I supported him. But I think looking back on it, it was a mistake. He'd got himself wrongly into a position of confrontation with the miners. I think probably there were ways out of it. But, you know, I admired Ted Heath. He was, very, I was a very obstinate man, but he was very determined and trying to do what he thought was right for Britain and very determined to try and make Britain into a modern country. He saw it as very lacklustre behind. He wanted passionately to make it more effective and more efficient. I think every, you know, people of, of my generation, I'm in, in, in late 60s now, and, and uh, will remember those three-day uh, week and the minor strike. We seemed to stretch on and on and on and on, didn't it, until uh, that, that election was, was called. Um, and, and then t tell us a little bit about you know, the, uh, those years after that election under the Labour government, and there was, things didn't go exactly smoothly then, did they? No, well, the Labour Party then was um, quite left wing. And I think at the time, I thought Harold Wilson was a very weak, bad prime minister. I think looking back on it, I was harsh. I think my judgment was wrong. I remember when Harold Wilson resigned very unexpectedly and rather mysteriously, he was asked, what did he think was his greatest achievement? And he said, keeping the Labour Party together. And I thought, what a ridiculous thing to regard as your greatest achievement. What, what, what's that? Just keeping your party together, doing what's in the interest of the country is what matters. Well, of course it is. But when I look back on how the extreme left, if I can put it that way, were a significant element in his party and how he managed to keep a center course while keeping them basically online, on, on, on side with uh, the odd maneuver here and there. You know, the country could have been ungovernable, but he, he uh, managed to steer his way through a whole series of crises. And to be honest, what he inherited from Ted Heath was a very difficult inheritance with a very high rate of inflation. And you know, Labour were lumbered with that. Right. But uh, gradually, um, you know, that level of inflation went up and then came down. But Labour had a very rough time.
I think the highest it got to was was almost twenty percent, wasn't it? The, it was yes, it was, it was yes. massive in, inflation. Yeah, and and but I think Callahan Callahan was the prime minister who I must say I rather admired, and Callahan was the first person really to become a monetarist, the first person to say that you, you couldn't just keep bailing people out by printing more money, increasing demand. You know, all that started under Healy and Callaghan rather than under Mrs. Thatcher and Geoffrey Howe. Right. And then there was the, uh, the, the Labour isn't working election. I remember the, the posters being, um, being put up and the, and the quite dramatic uh, uh, Mrs. Thatcher's sort of rise to fame. And, and, and you were a, 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 a supporter and a, a loyal supporter of Maggie. Is that right, Norman? Yes, I was a, a keen uh, supporter and I, I publicly declared that I would uh, uh, vote, vote, vote for her. Um, you know, I was, I was pretty enthusiastic uh, about it. And I, I remember I actually took her to lunch in the city on the day that she won the first round. It was a sort of tremendous experience to be going there. I remember I took her to a lunch in the city where everybody was extremely hostile to her. And they thought she was quite unrealistic. She'd never be able to do what she wanted to do. Why was she being so ridiculous? And a few hours later, of course, it was obvious she was going to become prime minister. I don't know what the people at that lunch thought about themselves. And that must have been, uh, in those days, you know, w w women's position wasn't uh, cemented like it is these days, although you know, there's still controversy about that. that it, it, to have a woman in that position, I think some people regard, used to see, uh, used to say about her, she was uh, uh, TBW, that bloody woman, because she could be difficult, couldn't she? Did, did you find her difficult to work with, work for? Yeah, just on the first point. Um, it was interesting, when Margaret ran for the leadership, I don't think I ever heard anyone, uh, I mean, she was elected by MPs, that was how it was done. I don't mm. think I ever heard anyone say, we can't have a woman prime minister. It, it wasn't an issue among MPs at all, and they just assumed the public would accept it, even though this was a big breakthrough in world politics, really. Mm. Um, was Margaret difficult? Uh, I always say uh, Margaret reminds me of what uh, Bernard Shaw said, that progress depends upon unreasonable people. I mean, she really sometimes adopted a position that seemed so far out, and yet often when she was at her most maddening, it turned out she was right. But mm -hmm. she, she could be very, very difficult. Um, Sometimes people said she was rude. She was certainly rude to cabinet ministers, but never rude to people who worked for her, whether they be secretaries, drivers. And when she was rude to political colleagues, it was usually when they, when they actually deserved it. But she could be devastatingly rude. I remember she was very, very rude to uh, somebody I worked for. Um, who's still alive, who I shan't name. She was rude in front of the whole cabinet. And I complained to her great favorite, Keith Joseph, about it. And he looked at me in utter astonishment. And I remember he said, oh, oh really? He said, you know her method. She deals in destructive dialogue. He <laughs> said, I get the lash the whole time. They send a stretcher for me. <laughs> and she must have sort of held court in uh, around that m massive cabinet table in, in Downing Street, did she? Did, did, did she brook uh, argument around the cabinet table or, or, or was she so clearly in charge that people were, were nervous about taking her on? Well, Margaret did have a habit of set, saying the conclusion of a meeting at the beginning of a meeting. <laughs> and you would think sometimes that she had not taken on board um, the objections and yet later she would change her mind or you would get a message that she decided not to uh, pursue something and sometimes I think it was a bit of a tease. Uh, I, re I remember an occasion when uh, Margaret had been on a plane coming back from New York and she'd been sitting next to a very good-looking silver-haired tall American called Lou Wasserman who ran MGM movies and Lou Wasserman persuaded her that the crowning glory of her time in 
uh, parliament or as prime minister was to be the construction of tax funded film studios on Raynham marshes in Essex. And Margaret asked me to come and see her and told me that she wanted public money for these film studios in Essex. And I expressed disbelief. And I said to her, but Prime Minister, we don't believe in subsidizing industry. And she glared at me. And I said, Prime Minister, there's no unemployment in uh, uh, Raynham Marshes in Essex where these studios were to be. Um, and she got anger and anger. And I said, Prime Minister, we'd have to build the roads to, to get there. <laughs> and uh, what are we doing this for? Uh, I, I really don't, we, I thought we wanted to control public spending and cut taxes. And she suddenly snapped at me and she said, you are utterly hopeless. All you ever say to me is no, no, no. You don't have a constructive idea in your head. And if you'd been in my government ever since 1979, uh, I wouldn't have achieved anything at all. And I took a deep breath and before I and thought, and then I said to her, well, Prime Minister, you may not have noticed, but actually I've been in your government ever since 1979. <laughs> and... Uh, I went back to my department and I said, the Prime Minister's taking leave of her census, but we better start working up on this. And a few hours later, a telephone call came through saying, please don't pursue the idea. <laughs> <laughs> so you had a reputation for, for being honest. Uh, Steve Norris, whom I talked to about, about you ahead of this, said, said that uh, one of the things he admired about you was your, your ability to talk uh, honestly to power, which uh, perhaps some of your colleagues didn't have that ability. But, uh, you know, the, the sort of decline and fall of Maggie Thatcher is, is uh, almost a Shakespearean story, isn't it, really? I mean, she rose to massive heights and was a, was a, a, achieved a, an enormous amount, but things sort of gradually went wrong. And, and, and was that partly because she lost so many of her top ministers one by one, they resigned? What, what, was, what underlay the, the decline and fall of Mrs Thatcher eventually, um, Norman? Well, Margaret had been in office for a very long time and you had the poll tax rumbling away. There was huge discontent in the country over that. I don't think it was very well handled. And MPs were very uneasy about that. And also you had the divisions on Europe and ironically, uh, Mrs. Hatcher was a, a head of the Conservative Party and being deeply sceptical about the way Europe was going. The backbenchers, a lot of them were still under the influence of Ted Heath and were very pro-European. And Margaret, in a way, was brought down partly, rather ironically, by the European issue. And you know, Michael Heseltine was obviously very keen on Europe. But I think the poll tax was one of the key uh, issues. Mm -hmm. And people felt Margaret, you know, Margaret had tremendous achievements uh, to her credit, but I think people felt she'd been there for a long, a long time. And a lot of people voted for her in the first round of the leadership election out of a sense of obligation. But it was clear, sadly to me, I mean, I was very enthusiastic for her and wanted her to continue. But it was clear that she was going to lose in the second round. And that's why I and some others, to her consternation, advised her that she would be better to resign because mm -hmm. she was going to be forced out. Did, did you remember that conversation? Did you have to go into Downing Street and and tell her that yourself or? Yes, I do. It was one of the most awful, unreal moments in my life. Mm. Um, various people had come to me with lists of MPs who had said, I voted for her out of a sense of loyalty that I ought to support a sitting prime minister, but she's held be below the water now with nearly 50, nearly 50% 50 of the party voting against her. She can't be sustained any longer. I'm going to vote against her next time. And I knew of 20 people who were in that position. Mm. And so I told her, I, I said to her, that I wouldn't tell anyone else, but this was my uh, advice to her, that in her own interest, she ought to resign because she would lose the next round. And it was wiser to resign rather than be forced out in a humiliating vote. But I did say, if you don't agree with me, and if you want to carry on and fight the second round, I will support you. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, it was the next day she resigned. Yeah, with those famous images outside Downing Street with uh, her in the car and tears in the eyes and so on. And then there was the drama of, of who would succeed her. Um, and I, I think you had a, a major row with Nigel Lawson. I, <coughs> I read uh, that you hung up on Nigel Lawson in a, in a, <laughs> a rage. Is that right, Norman? <laughs> Well, I don't know if it was a rage. I mean, let me say, Nigel Lawson is uh, a very good friend of mine, right. someone to whom I'm deeply indebted and someone who I massively admire. But uh, I, I was amazed that uh, Nigel decided to support Michael Heseltine rather than John Major, because I felt John Major was much nearer Margaret's and Nigel's ideas than Michael Heseltine was. That may or may not have been proved right or wrong, but that was what I thought at the time. And I rang up Nigel and I just couldn't get any explanation from him. And <laughs> I think I did shout at him down the phone. And yeah. put, when, he, when he rang back, I, I'm afraid rather rudely, I refused to take the call. I'm rather ashamed of my behavior, but it was the passion of the moment. Yeah, it, it, it was an extraordinary moment. I think uh, I'm sure a lot of people remember the details of it. So then, then let's move on then to, to the major government. And that brings us into the issue of the of European money and our, our links with Europe, which is still resonating on 40 years after, um, or 30 years after. So um, what was it like working with John Major? I've met him a couple of times, John Major. He, he seems a very nice guy but not as charismatic as one might anticipate for somebody who gets to be prime minister any what are you what, what was it like working with with john well my, my relationship with him did deteriorate over time but let me mm. say i think john major was a better prime minister than many people uh think uh, or have said, and you know, he had a very difficult act to follow. I think it was very difficult to be prime minister following such a strong, uh, transformative person as Margaret Thatcher, mm -hmm. and it was difficult to keep the Conservative Party to together with a lot of people uh, hurt by the defenestration of Margaret, and then you had the looming issue of Europe and the ERM and the single currency and where was Europe going. So it was very, very difficult for him. Uh, I sometimes thought he didn't really have enough of a view himself. Uh, I, I'm sure he would quarrel with that, but that was my view at the time. But, you know, he was a very skilled politician. And we we joined the ERM under under his prime ministership, if that's the right word, uh, premiership. That's the word. Um, and it, it, from what my reading of it, there didn't seem to be a large amount of discussion about that. T tell us how that actually happened: the, the the joining the ERM and then the issue of of uh, uh, us falling out. And so so. Just well, a little bit well, of background but, to it. Well, I, I played no part in the decision to join. I was a treasury minister. I was chief secretary, Ooh. but I was just informed this was happening. I think I was asked my view the day before we joined. Um, what did you say when they asked you your view? Well, I didn't raise an objection, although I had publicly previously expressed opposition to joining because when Nigel Lawson resigned, somebody asked me in Parliament publicly why I hadn't resigned with Nigel Lawson. And I replied, because I don't agree that we should join the ERM. I mean, I was actually very skeptical about the ERM. But when you say there wasn't much discussion, it was overwhelming support among business mm. for joining the ERM. Let, let me just remind you exactly what the ERM was. The ERM was a sort of currency grid whereby the pound was linked to all the European currencies that were in this currency grid. So you were linked to 294 Deutschmarks to the pound to the Deutschmark and also to the lira to a particular rate, the French franc to a particular rate. And the French franc was linked to uh, the lira and the Deutschmark at a particular rate. So it was a 
a system which kept fixed rates for all the countries that had decided to join the ERM. It wasn't the first fixed rate exchange rate system we'd had. We'd had one with Bretton Woods for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And so when I became chancellor, uh, I didn't, although I hadn't wanted to join the ERM, I didn't uh, think to myself, oh, this thing will disintegrate because we'd had the experience of fixed exchange rates before and they'd worked perfectly well. What caused the problems in the ERM was that Germany was the dominant currency, the biggest economy. And so what Germany did with their interest rates influenced what everybody else could do with theirs. And Germany was at a different point in the cycle from Britain. Germany was enjoying a post-reunification boom and needed higher interest rates. Britain was entering into a recession, not caused by the ERM, it would have happened anyway, but we needed lower interest rates. And so you had a conflict within the system between the needs of Germany and the needs of other countries like ourselves. That was what caused the basic uh, strain and the basic problem. And, and then it, it ended up with the, with the drama of us falling out of the ERM on um, Black Wednesday, I think it was September, maybe, 22nd of September, if I remember. 16th. 16th, whoops, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> People call it Black Monday, Black Wednesday, Black Friday. I get asked all sorts of variants about it. <laughs> talk, talk us through it because you know we, we, we'll come to your famous, um, well, you're, what you're quoted as, as uh, saying that you were whistling in the bath at the time. But what was it like that day? I mean, it must have been high drama, mustn't it? Well, first of all, let me say, when you say... I mean, I make this point so often, it, but it never <laughs> lodges with people. When you say Britain left the ERM, the ERM basically exploded. Uh, yeah. I think there were nine countries devalued. That's what it was. We were devaluing against the Deutschmark. But I think there were nine countries in Europe that uh, devalued at the same time. It was only Germany and the Danish Krona that was closely linked to it and the Austrian shilling uh, that managed to maintain that and the French franc temporarily for a year. But yeah. basically the ERM ceased to exist. But the way it was portrayed in Britain was that Britain had left the ERM and the ERM was still there. The ERM had virtually ceased to exist. Italy devalued, devalued twice. Ireland devalued, devalued twice. We, mm -hmm. ju we, we just uh, uh, devalued and left and floated. Uh, which actually was a situation I was perfectly comfortable with. And when you said, I was rather amused at you saying I whistled in the bath. I was accused of singing in the bath. Right. Um, it's one of those incidents where, as so often happens, the press got it slightly wrong or slightly exaggerated it. I mean, the, the story became that I was singing in my bath on Black Wednesday. Mm -hmm. but the truth was that several days after Black Wednesday, like five days after or a week after, I can't quite remember, I was in Washington, miles away, and the sun was shining, and a reporter said to me, you seem very uh, happy today, uh, Mr. Lamont. And I said, it's funny you say that. My wife heard, said she heard me singing in the bath this morning. And that <laughs> became the fact that I was supposed to have sung on the day that we left. It wasn't quite true. but. <laughs> In its exaggeration, the press saw a truth that I did not regard. I mean, I had done everything I could to maintain our position in the URM, but once uh, I, I had grown more and more dissatisfied with the ERM, and I had twice suggested to John Major that we ought temporarily to suspend our membership because I felt the squeeze that it necessitated, while it had done as good initially, um, was now medicine that we didn't need. And so when we were f forced to leave this disintegrating mechanism, I was not completely displeased, even though I fought hard to try and remain within it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, were the tensions between you and John Major, because I think he, he was, and of course still is, a, a very pro-European, and, and I think you're a you might be regarded as the sort of father of Brexit, and we'll come on to talk about Brexit to, in a few minutes. But your relationship with with John Major um, must have soured. Was it though? Was it the European issue that 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 uh, did, uh, caused things to deteriorate, or 
Well, I, I, I think you? probably, yes. I mean, he and I are different sort of people, but, you know, we didn't get on badly most of, of the time. But, mm. you know, sometimes we had uh, different views. And I was always clear that, for example, I would never join the Euro. Um, and I didn't want the ERM to become the Euro. Some people thought that's what the ERM was all about. But, you know, Nigel Lawson supported the ERM, but did not believe in joining the Euro. Um, I think John Major, you know, wasn't crystal clear whether he would or would not join the Euro. And I don't think he my impression, rightly or wrongly, was that he couldn't make up his mind about this. Um, and I think that was a slight uh, tension between, between us. Um, and I think he felt sometimes, you know, in letting my views be clear, I was letting the side down. I remember there was one occasion when, well, there was a, a referendum on Maastricht in France. And... Uh, I, I was in Washington at the time it happened and all the other European finance ministers were there and Chancellor Cole wrote to John Major to complain that it was perfectly clear that I wanted the no vote to win in France and Chancellor Cole found this perfectly offensive and I think John Major was rather shocked that I'd let my views protrude. <laughs> and th there were some dramas uh, actually during the Maastricht conference uh, weren't there, Norman? Um, well, the, whole, the, 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 Maastricht, the Maastricht conference was just the culmination of the creation of the Euro. But the, the preparations for that, I was the main ministerial negotiator for the monetary part of Maastricht, and the monetary part was nine-tenths of it. It was The Maastricht Treaty was about the creation of the Euro. And I have never believed and still not do not believe in the idea of a single currency for Europe. I thought it was a bad idea and I still think it was a, a bad idea. And you know, our policy, John Major and I both agreed on this, and John, it was John Major's idea actually, that we should have an opt-out, that we should not participate uh, whatever Although, as I've said, I think John Major thought one day we might opt in. I thought we should opt out forever, forever in a day and have no part of it. And so, you know, that was that argument went on for a year. But um, you know, when you were saying there was a moment of drama, there were lots of moments of drama. But I think what you're particularly re referring to was towards the end, uh, I've submitted a piece of paper which listed all the areas in the Maastricht Treaty that to do with the single currency that Britain must be exempt from. And I presented it to the Dutch chairman of the meeting. I said, this is what we must have. We won't sign up to anything less. And he said, well, we're going to discuss it item by item. And I said, well, it's not up for negotiation. This is the minimum we need in order to sign the treaty while not participating in the Euro. And he immediately announced we were going to go through my paper line by line and everybody would give their view. So at that point, I stood up and walked out of the meeting feeling very rather angry. And I actually tried to slam the door. In <laughs> and I remember the door was so thick. It was about nine inches thick. It just moved very slowly and made a creaking noise and didn't make the slamming effect that I had designed for myself. <laughs> so the drama was was uh, diluted a bit. Anyway, I went off and had a cup of coffee for an hour and a half. And when I came back, they'd agreed my piece of paper with no exemptions. <laughs> so do you think, yeah, I mean, could, can we credit you with keeping us out of the euro or, or, or was that going to happen anyway at, at that stage? Well, that, that was the government's policy. Um, I, I negotiated it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it was the government's policy, and it was John Major's policy as as well. And it, would it would it have been a disaster had we looking back had we joined the euro? <clears throat> well, I think it would. I mean, when you consider our experience in the ERM, which, as I tried to explain, uh, 
was due to having different economic conditions in Germany and Britain at the same time. At least we could get out of the ERM and I was able to design a monetary policy that suited our own conditions. If we'd been locked in the Euro, we wouldn't have been able to get out of it. You can't leave the Euro. It's much more difficult if it's possible at all. As William Hay said, you know, being in the ERM might have been like being in a burning house but being in the euro was like being in a burning house and there was no door out <laughs> tell us a, a bit then because you you were john major's chancellor of the exchequer for three years and then um then uh you resigned um what what was behind that resignation i'm uh, uh, did you and john fall out or what what was the main issue that that made you feel you had to resign well i think there were two issues. Um, the, the, the first way was that, frankly, I was extremely unpopular. People were, you know, angry about the ERM. I, you know, I personally was absolutely confident that leaving the ERM would not do us any harm at all. But people felt that the tight policy had all been pointless if we then threw it away by leaving. But I don't agree with that at all. The policy had worked, but it, the tool had outlived its usefulness and the mm -hmm. tool disintegrated when it had ceased to do its job. But that, that was, you know, public dissatisfaction with, with that, the ERM. And at the time we left the ERM, John Major told me not to resign. I did consider resigning because obviously it was a humiliation politically, even if it was not disastrous economically. Um, but John Major didn't want me to resign and I consulted other cabinet colleagues and they said, for goodness sake, don't resign because it was John Major's policy. Mm. He, he took us in and he was the enthusiast for it. You carried the can for it. But if you resign, you will, um, you will merely deflect the unpopularity onto him and it will be much more difficult for the government. So don't resign. So, you know, I think part of it was a delayed reaction to my unpopularity. Um, you know, we'd got to March, which was, uh, you know, some six months later. So I think that it, it, it was that. And secondly, you know, I think relations had become a bit uh, frayed over Europe as, uh, as, as well. But no, sorry, the second point was really, I had introduced in March, I, I resigned in May, it was actually eight months after the um, but I had introduced in March an extremely tough budget. And I would say that it was the most unpopular thing I did, and it made me even more unpopular, but I think it was the right thing and it was the best thing I ever did. Mm -hmm. um, what, what I did, because we'd run up a large budget deficit, a very small budget deficit by today's standards, but it was 7% of GDP, 70 billion quid, which was alarming and I was alarmed by it. But we were in the process of the economic recovery was just beginning and I didn't want to kill off the economic recovery. And yet we needed to do something to stem the flow of blood from this deficit. So what I did was to announce tax increases for future years, uh, some of them in the current year, but most of them two years away or three years away, which made it clear, along with public expenditure restraint, that the budget deficit would come down, but it wouldn't come down as a result of measures, so much of measures being taken now. So it was a sort of delayed fuse. And, you know, that included things like VAT on fuel and power. And you know, it was tremendously unpopular. I remember the headline in the Daily Mirror was a picture of me saying, the ice man cometh, and I was standing next to an igloo. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, I think the Mirror also described it as a cheap and shabby budget from a cheap and shabby man. But it was the right budget, and it lowered the budget deficit. And Kenneth Clark, who came after me, didn't have to do anything to reduce the budget deficit. Right, and it, and it probably those those changes did lead on to the sort of boom. Well, years. it stabilised the economy, and the real beneficiary was Gordon Brown, actually. Yeah. yeah. So uh, those before we 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 come back to Europe again, the, the, uh, your thoughts about those last years of the major government, where you I think said that um, he was in office but not in power, uh, which. Um, some people re-quoted about Mrs. May, I think, um, uh, uh, much more recently. Um, 
I mean, those are the days where Major was talking about the bastards and, and uh, Tony Blair uh, and so on was looming up. Um, were the, they, must, they must have been quite difficult years for everybody, were they? Yes. I mean, I think John Major faced, you know, the difficulty of the longevity of the Conservative government. You'd had the whole of Mrs. Thatcher's three election victories. You had John Major's victory in 1992. The Conservatives had been in power for such a long pe period, and there'd never really been a choice for the electorate because <clears throat> Michael Foote was not really credible. Uh, Neil Kinnock didn't appear. I mean, I think, again, people were probably more harsh on Neil Kinnock than they should have been. And I think he was fighting hardline leftists much more than we knew in the Labour Party. But Mr. Satcher was easily a match for Neil Kinnock. Uh, John Smith had died. Blair was the first sort of really credible, reasonable Labour leader. He made the Labour Party electable. And so it was much more difficult for John Major at the end of such a long period of Conservative government. And also discipline was breaking down within the party then. Yeah. And, and uh, they were a force to be reckoned with, weren't they? The Tony Blair and Mandelson and, and the others. Well, let's, let's move a, a little bit because we've only got 10 minutes or so left. Um, I mean as well as, as being the architect of the, of the economic recovery in the 1990s that we've already discussed, um, and people seem to agree on that from what I've uh, read, Norman, but you, you're also, to some extent, the, 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 the beginning of the, the Eurosceptic wing of the Conservative Party, which is now, of course, in charge after uh, 30 years later. So t tell us a little bit about that. And, and I think you were the, one of the earliest people to say you couldn't really see much advantage from being uh, strongly linked to to Europe or to the euro so get, I'd like to hear your view on uh, on the sort of birth of euro skepticism and and right up to date in in where we are now with you know perhaps a trade agreement not being agreed by by the end of this year well I think it was when I was Chancellor my innate skepticism about Europe grew, really. The first reason was because at Maastricht, I realized when people talked about Europe becoming the United States of Europe, I had always thought they didn't really mean it. It was rhetoric. It was an aspiration that would never be realized. But there they were creating the single currency and talking to them privately. I realized that they were serious about this and they wanted to create a new state, a new country called Europe to replace the existing nation states of Europe. Now, different people have different views on this, but for me personally, I reject that. I find it unacceptable. I don't think the nation state of Britain has yet outlived its usefulness. Maybe one day all national governments will disappear, but to my mind, democracy is best operated locally and where there is a sense of identity uh, and commonality. And I found the way in which Europe was going alarming. I also, as Chancellor, noted that you know, while we were supposed to be getting all this advantage out of this so-called single market, um, other countries who were not members managed to take advantage of the single market as well. You know, America, Japan, China were increasing their market share in the single market faster than we were without being members. So what was the advantage of being a member? Obviously, when you sell into a market, you have to observe its rules, just as Europeans selling into America have to observe American rules. But what was the advantage of being a member? And we were paying... 10, 13, 20 billion a year in order to be part of this single market. And this single market, as I said, was developing in a political direction that I didn't want. But I grew increasingly skeptical whether there was really any economic advantage. And I noted how a country like Switzerland, at the heart of Europe, a much more European country than we are, actually is much more integrated with the European Union. Integration doesn't depend on governments, it depends on people and businesses. And Europe 
naturally is integrated through natural economic forces with the European Union. And I couldn't see why we couldn't be and why we couldn't be self-governing, but sell into the European market. Um, uh, and in 1994, uh, a year after I'd ceased to be Chancellor, I very cautiously at a party conference uh, said two things very precisely. I said first that I couldn't see any advantage that unambiguously comes from Europe. I left it slightly open, unambiguously comes from Europe, and that I'd grown sceptical of the value of being a member of the European Union. And then referring to the direction in which Europe was going, I did say, I think one day the issue of whether we should remain members of the European Union may return to the political agenda. And we may have to decide whether we want to be part of a new state called Europe or whether we wish to leave the European Union. And the British people may have to decide that one day. And well, indeed, that is, is what happened. And that was but, pathetic. But, and, and, and bringing up to, you know, the current situation, although you know, maybe we should talk a little bit about David Cameron, because it was David Cameron's promise to hold the referendum that eventually led to the referendum result that we have now. But you, David Cameron worked for you, didn't he, at one stage? Yes, he was my special advisor. Mm -hmm. um, I first came across him in the 92 general election when he was working in Conservative Central Office and he used to brief John Major and I and I was extremely impressed by him and made up my mind that after the election, if we won, actually I thought we were going to lose the 92 election. I was completely yeah, a lot wrong. A of people did, I think, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was um, but one of the things I was determined was I would try and get... Uh, David Cameron to come and work for me as a special advisor, and he did. I was very pleased, he, and he was absolutely excellent, and I like him very much and admire him. And because he get, people would criticize him that, you know, he, he, we've left Europe sort of, sort of by mistake, by, well, certainly in his terms, he, he never never expected to lose that that referendum. Um, but we are where we are, and, and you're, you're, are you optimistic about our our economic prospects outside Europe now, Norman? Yeah, can, can I just say about David Cameron? Sure. I don't think, I mean, people blame him for holding the referendum. I don't think he had any alternative but to hold the referendum. The Conservative Party was splintering. If you remember, members of Parliament were defecting and joining UKIP. UKIP had come top in the European parliamentary elections, and it looked as though UKIP was going to split the Conservative vote and hand victory to Labour. And the only way in which this situation could be lanced, the bar could be lanced, was actually by holding a referendum. Of course, David Cameron was, the mistake he made was that he thought he would win it, but I don't think he had any alternative but to hold that referendum. But he was perhaps overconfident because he'd won the Scottish referendum, and he thought he could do the same. Well, most people were surprised the referendum went the way it did. And so coming up up to date now with, with Boris Johnson. I mean, uh, uh, I, yeah, you were going to, sorry, you were going to ask me what about I thought. Well, I hope I've made clear my own reasons for leaving the European Union have always been political rather than economic. Um, you know, there may be a bit of a bump at the point we leave. Um, it's difficult, difficult to tell, but I think the country will quickly adapt. I think people will find that the... Diff I personally believe, could be wrong, but I believe that we will find it makes not nearly as much difference as we think it would have done. Our trade proportionally with Europe is on a declining trend because the rest of the world is growing faster. Um, that trend will probably continue, but it won't be because of Brexit. It will be because of that's the way it would have been anyway. But, you know, we will continue to trade. Europe is a very important market for us and it is next door. And German, uh, not just Germany, but the European Union sells much more to us than we do to them, as everybody knows, and they will be keen to. What I do want to have, you know, I'm not anti-European. I'm critical of the EU, but if the EU, other countries want to join it and belong to it and it develops well and good. But I want to, I do genuinely believe what Theresa May called in a close partnership with the European Union. I want us to be close. I want us, you know, to be close on things like foreign policy as well. We mustn't just be the tool or the poodle of America. Mm -hmm.
And, and uh, any any thoughts about our current prime minister? I know you, you know him uh, quite well. And and do you think he really is a Euro skeptic, or or is it true that that you know he he span a, a tossed a coin and 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 chose that direction by chance? No, I absolutely know that his views on Europe are genuinely Euro skeptical. Um, I first got to know Boris Johnson when I was Chancellor, when he was the Daily Telegraph's uh, reporter in Brussels. And he used to ask me questions at all the press conferences after the council met. And here was I, as I saw myself, defending Britain's interests, avoiding us getting dragged into needless integration. And all the time, Boris would attack me for not being robust enough, not being tough enough, and selling out to the Europeans. And he, he was plainly uh, very, very hostile to the concept of needless European uh, in integration. It's true that when the moment of the referendum came, he was supposed to, I say it's true, but he was supposed to have written two articles listing the arguments for and against leaving. But I can understand that because there were, I went through a difficult process, you know, despite everything I'd said in the past, do we really want to take this step? Or, are there ways in which we could have safeguarded ourselves, perhaps by renegotiating our membership, getting certain safeguards? But, you know, we tried all that at Maastricht, and I came to the conclusion there were no further moves we could make that would safeguard ourselves against future integration. Um, and I think Boris went through the same sort of process, and like me, but or I like him, came to the conclusion that uh, the only way in which our vision of Britain as a self-governing country could be preserved would be by actually voting for leave. Right. Well, we're almost out of time. I, I haven't had time to ask you any, uh, um, any questions, but I do, I'm going to put one to you now. Um, John Mason points out that the way that Germany closed down its coal mines compared uh, with the UK, uh, it, the, the, their communities felt valued, not destroyed. I mean, of your all your years as a politician, uh, what regrets? What would you say? Wish you'd, you'd done in a different way. What what regrets do you have now, looking back? Well, I wouldn't. Uh, you know, the miners' uh, confrontation was a terrible event, but I didn't. I wouldn't accept the comparison with Germany because the German mines are very different from ours. Um, Germany has a lot of lignite and a lot of mining that is much nearer the surface and I think they are much more competitive German coal mining than British uh, coal, coal mining was. So I think the need to uh, uh, close down the mines in Britain, the cost of them I think was far greater than the cost of German uh, mines. Um, what, what regrets do I have? Well I have plenty of uh, uh, regrets. There are some tax reforms I'd like to have made. I think at one point uh, when I was Chancellor, perhaps I ought to have been tougher on public expenditure. You know, I have those sorts of uh, uh, regrets. Um, but, uh, you know, Black Wednesday isn't one of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it certainly, um, certainly you've lived through amazing times and it's been so much fun talking to you, Norman. So, uh, I'd like to say thank you so much for taking the time and trouble to uh, talk to a bunch of doctors in the Royal Society of Medicine. Uh, we're privileged to uh, have, have, have you on, uh, on our webinar. Um, I'd just like to remind everybody that uh, next week, next Wednesday, we have Ken Follett, the uh, author of uh, a number of very famous books. I think he sold 160 million copies of his books. Uh, and Hilary DeLion, our, uh, one of our trustees, will be interviewing him. Uh, a week today. Uh, I also wanted to mention very importantly on Monday at 4 p.m. we have a international meeting on COVID-19. We've got some of the best uh, world experts uh, from America, from India, from the UK, from uh, many other countries talking about COVID for a couple of hours. It's a free webinar. You can sign up on uh, our RSM website or uh, RSM live. Uh, hashtag RSM Live. So I do hope you'll uh, join us there. We've got nearly 5,000 people signed up. So once again, Norman, thank you so much for taking the time and trouble. My it's pleasure. Thank you. you. And congratulations on saving the nation. <laughs> I'd hardly that. <laughs>
Well, you did some great things. So thank you and goodbye. <laughs>